kind of hope or um, optimism uh, at a very, very difficult time. Uh, and what the churches can do or what, what they, how they can feed into or, they, or be, begin to create a sense of hope because there isn't a lot of hope around uh, a great deal of public commentary at the moment. You know, it's full of statistics and it's full of don'ts and be careful because this might happen as a consequence. And I mean, talking from a much broader, I think actually the public messaging whilst it was necessary for it to be very direct and we understood how difficult things were in COVID, I don't think it's been particularly nuanced. I don't think it has managed to combine the sense of um, having to keep people safe and secure, but also the ability to keep some basis for social living going on, because it would be very easy for that to break down completely in a sense, you know, where people hardly to know how to get on with somebody the next time. Uh, they meet them in the street. Um, but a couple of things, I'll just make a couple of, of uh, observations of kind of hopeful things that I've seen, I suppose. And one of them, and it's a very, uh, it's, not, it's not really flippant, but I suppose it's not terribly serious, is that, and this might just apply to Protestant churches, I'm not too sure, or it might apply to others, is that because now we've returned to worshipping in churches, people have to sit everywhere in the church. They can't all sit at the back. <laughs> and that, that has actually had a quite a significant psychological effect, certainly for the person looking, looking down. Um, for the per you know, it's quite a, it's a bit of, a, it's a, bit of a, a kind of morale booster that there are people all over the place that they're talking to. And it's funny, even in quite large churches, which could maybe hold 500 or 600 people and can now only hold 70, it actually looks quite respectable when you have the 70 spread around like that, and it's just much easier to engage with. So that's, I mean, that's a very, very, very small thing, obviously. Yeah. From the point of view of church leaders, one of the, the, the huge differences is that we have met pretty well fortnightly, and there was a time when we were meeting weekly, whereas before we would have met maybe three or four times a year. Um, so, um, uh, we worked together on, um, although each individual church, for instance, worked on its own protocols of return to in-church worship, which were a big thing, um, we were able to compare and contrast what it was we were doing, share that. And maybe even more importantly, we were able to share those sorts of things with very small churches, um, either small independent churches, you just wouldn't have had the resources to do that themselves, or with particularly Orthodox churches, who was a very small presence in Ireland, um, but who really, whose headquarters, whether it was in Constantine, whether it was in um, Istanbul or whether it was wherever, wouldn't quite have understood the cultural um, nuances here, the requirement to stick very, very strictly to protocols. Um, and that close working together, you know, meant that we were able to speak to the executive office pretty frequently as, as a group and also maybe even more helpfully with the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor mm -hmm. who have been extremely helpful in encouraging what it is we do and in doing that what we I think definitely did was to demonstrate if anybody was in any doubt that we were very serious dialogue partners, very serious players in civic society that we could be depended on and trusted to bring people together in what, you know, when there were, when people, when the society was beginning to open up, people were very afraid that it would just be impossible to bring people together. And we put together means of doing that um, and our Irish clergy responded to that. I know they, when, they probably, when they got the protocols through the first time, I can imagine what they said, and I'm sure not all of it's repeatable, or certainly recordable, but nevertheless, it has proved its worth, uh, in a sense. Um, and, um, you know, when we talked, for instance, to people from the executive office, they, they were sort of emphasising that there's a social contract now, uh, in a sense, between government and people, where we're depending 
on one another in a way to fulfil the obligations uh, that we have. Uh, and um, I think we, the churches, at that level anyway, responded well to that. Uh, and that um, because we, the churches, are going to have to get used to living in a much more pluralist society. And I think that's absolutely right that we have to do that. That we don't have an overwhelmingly important voice. What we do, we do have something to say. That that helped to demonstrate to people that it couldn't be a pluralism like it is in France, you know, the easy day where the churches are just pushed to one side and have no voice. But um, a group of responsible people who had a lot to contribute, not just in at that level, but in the stuff that was going on um, in the communities. And I, I just, I, I don't want to go on forever. The other thing, which I'm sure everybody knows and everybody has recognised, is that when we were solely conducting online worship, there were far more attendees than there would normally be on a Sunday. So, um, now they didn't necessarily stay for a very long time, about 20 minutes seemed to be, 20, 25 minutes seemed to be. So what we got was a very large number of people either who didn't go to church at all, or perhaps who had done but hadn't for a while, or came very infrequently, sort of sticking their head around the door and having a bit of a look. And the challenge then was, when things opened up again, how do you encounter those people? Um, uh, do you even know when it is you're encountering them? Um, and they, I suppose one of the lessons that came to me from it is that we need to, and this is why I phrase it, it may not be terribly accurate that we need to realize that the Holy Spirit can live in places that we find a bit odd and that we should never reduce God to our experience of him. Uh, and that therefore there was there were there were opportunities and there was hope out there. It may not turn out to look like what it has been in the past, but nevertheless, and I suppose that's the thing about the Holy Spirit, is God making connections that um, we made connections in that time with people who we wouldn't have had an opportunity to make connections with before uh, and somehow or another to try to try to build on that. But I, I stopped there because... Yeah. Uh, just uh, uh, Archbishop John, just to sort of continue and pick up on some of the themes that you've already mentioned. I think, first of all, uh, we will all have to admit that this has been an unprecedented time for all of us in the churches. Um, essentially, our lives have been turned upside down by this whole uh, virus crisis, going way back to, to, to late February and March, where we were struggling, and in, in many ways very fearful about what might lie ahead for us. Uh, do you remember those things like flattening the curve and, and trying to make it to the summer months? And, I think there was a genuine fear uh, in our people and a certain amount of that remains. Uh, I, I think that there's still that sense of uncertainty about what lies ahead over the winter months and how we're going to cope. Will we be safe, etc. There is no doubt that the whole COVID-19 crisis essentially drove our congregations indoors. Uh, this whole idea of staying apart um, not being able to have the public celebration of, of worship, um, not being able also to reach out to the sick. I think these were some of the things that I really felt uh, deep down. Um, every fiber of our being as ministers within the church is to reach out. It's to be with people, it's to hug them, it's to hold them, it's to hold their hand or to bless them, to, to, to be present with them. And yet all of these things were very cruelly interrupted by, by, by the COVID virus. I, I'm also thinking of some of the wonderful celebrations that we have in church, like baptism, marriage, um, you know, some of the big sacraments and ordinances and uh, where we do gather people together and everything about us as church is about gathering. So this 
COVID-19 virus essentially drove a, a missile into the heart of who we are. And we were very quickly forced to, to recalibrate and to, to try to say, how can we continue to be church? And, and I actually think that just by reminding ourselves of how serious this all seemed at the beginning, uh, it, it also serves to, to remind us of how well we did. <laughs> you know, the, I, I don't want to be clapping us all on the back, but we did reach out in other ways, in new ways, as uh, Archbishop John has just said. And uh, that whole idea of reaching out through social media in worship, we talked about it for years. We talked about the, the digital uh, continent going out to the digital continent. We'd, we had maybe played around a little bit with webcams. I re the webcam has been in our cathedral here for years, but I have to confess until this verse, I was totally oblivious to it. Now I'm much more aware that there's a whole world behind that webcam of people looking in, reaching in, and reaching out for consolation and strength and for nourishment and for spiritual guidance. And, and, and what, what John has just said about the numbers of people, we would have found the same. Our, our webcam providers telling us that the, the statistics for people uh, attending, in inverted commas, worship, were, were much greater than anything we might expect to have in person. Mind you, one uh, lady said to me, she says, I'm still, I'm still joining you from home, she says. And let me tell you this, Archbishop, she said, um, the day I have to go back, she says, I'm going to miss doing my ironing during worship. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, hadn't, I hadn't the heart to tell her, you really shouldn't be doing your ironing during worship. <laughs> and I didn't want to, to, to deflate her, but I actually think that that little, what we would have termed the domestic church, the church at home, the church in the family, uh, perhaps found a new uh, uh, energy uh, during the, the crisis. Um, I, I got a lovely picture sent to me of uh, a family in their front room where the, the, the little ones had actually set up like a, what appeared to be like an altar with candles lit beside the laptop and uh, the wee fella, he was serving the mass at home. Uh, and uh, you probably saw that funny one that was doing the rounds in social media with the wee fella going around with a basket uh, in his front room. But, but I do feel the domestic church and the centrality of the family. Uh, one uh, a particular couple I'm aware of told me that their teenage daughter and son never would go to worship with them but they would sit in the front room and join in the webcam. Uh, and those things really have shaken us a little bit to wonder, um, is there something there that we now will lose if we think everything will go back to the way it was? Um, in, in drawing attention also to the pain and the, the struggles of that time, uh, I think we have to be mentioning the sick, uh, those who, who uh, had somebody in a nursing home, those who had someone in hospital and, and uh, very sadly those who did have people who died uh, during and who are continuing to die. We have a, a funeral coming up here now uh, in the parish and people continuing to die with COVID uh, or in some way related to COVID. And then that really difficult, uh, hard to moving uh, you know, situation where, where you know, we're not able to, to do to do funerals the way we were so used to that kind of presence and consolation and support um, with that in mind the amazing way that families have found to create an intimacy surrounding those very sad moments um, I, I think for example it was all over the, the tv and that you know when when john hume died for example uh, uh, in my hometown uh, <coughs> The, the number of people who participated in a little candlelight moment in their homes on the night before, the family said, look, we don't want people lying in the streets. We don't want people to be gathering. Would you please just say a prayer at home at nine o'clock? And uh, the number of people who did that was quite amazing. And I'm aware of it because even in my home street, people had their candles in the windows. 
that, okay, this was in Derry, John Hume's own constituency, and there's a very deep respect for the man. But I do feel that people have tried to find new ways of expressing their solidarity and their closeness to those who are suffering throughout this awful time. Uh, another uh, one was just last Saturday, uh, I did the wedding for my niece. Uh, she had planned to be married, her and Ross, on the 12th of September uh, with 180 guests. Uh, she came to me in June and she says, Eamon, do you think will we be able to go ahead? And I says, look, Catherine, I said, a lot of couples are um, postponing because they want to be able to still have their friends and their extended family. She says, but Ross and I, we want to be married. <laughs> We, we, we want our wedding day. And she said, do you think we could go ahead if it was just us and you and a few witnesses? Now, in the end, we had the wedding on Saturday and there were 17 people present, the two immediate families. It was an extremely intimate moment. Uh, a lot of people joined us on the webcam and there was a big wave out to all their friends who would have been at the wedding. The, the wedding dinner was one table socially distanced in a local hotel with, uh, with uh, basically 17 people present but somehow as I said to them we got to the core and the kernel of what was actually happening that day once all the paraphernalia and the usual externals that kind of have get crashed in on top of weddings nowadays once they were put aside somehow we were able to get to the core of what was happening. To, I was laughing, it was a real Julia Roberts moment. Uh, I'm just a girl standing in the front of a boy asking him to love her. But in a sense, the marriage, marriage is two people in the presence of God and the community saying, I love you and I want to be yours for the rest of my life. And somehow we were able to capture that in a way that I think might have been more difficult with all of the, the externals. Um, I do think that another point I'd like to mention would be the massive charitable outreach. Um, I visited the Armagh COVID-19 community response team here, um, and I was absolutely amazed at where people have come together uh, to reach out to the isolated, the lonely, the elderly, the vulnerable, to bring them groceries, to, to, to just do phone calls, to wish them well, in some cases to pray with them. Um, and there was this a massive outpouring of, of goodness and charity and generosity and care. And I, I don't want to take all the credit for the churches, but a very large number of the people who were there, who were organizing and who were volunteering are people who regularly attend our parishes, our congregations, uh, and they are people, I feel, who were doing so because of that sense of Christian charity and wanting to reach out, including a lot of young people volunteering and feeling, I'm able to do something here, I'm able to make some tangible uh, personal response to this, whether it be uh, stocking a food bank or, or maybe fetching groceries or just calling up people to say, are you all right? Uh, I just feel this is something that we in our churches might learn from and, and, and take forward. And the final point I would make is uh, the, 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 the imposed monasticism, as I call it, where we had to lock ourselves in. Uh, that has forced a lot of us, myself included, to reflect on what is it that I value? What are the things that are important? A lot of the things that I did and spent my time doing, traveling, running around the place, I wonder, I've learned that a lot of those were superfluous and that there are deeper questions for me personally and a lot of people have said that they have prayed more during the, the, the lockdown and through this crisis. People saying that they have wondered about some of the ways they spent their time, they spent their money, and they have found themselves drawing closer in more quality ways to their family 
and to those who mean a lot to them. That's not in any way to dismiss the harrowing reality of uh, increased uh, domestic violence, uh, increased uh, mental health issues. But I do feel that somewhere in the middle of all of this, people have been searching and are continuing to search and wondering, this COVID thing has turned the whole world upside down. Uh, so what are my values? What are the things that I stand for? Where is God in the midst of this crisis? There's been a certain amount of existential questioning here. What is this all about? We were so used to personal autonomy, individual choice. We do whatever we want. We go wherever we want. We spend whatever we want. We consume whatever we want. But suddenly people are saying, no, you cannot go there. You must stay in. And we've all had to endure a certain amount of sacrifice for the greater good, for the common good and for the good um, promotion of health and well-being of others. And that in itself is a very Christian thing, self-sacrifice for the other. And I have, I really do feel that it's only now and an occasion like this tonight that we're able to maybe reflect on what has been going on and what it has been saying to us. And I really feel that that might be something that we might usefully take forward in this conversation. Back to you, Archbishop John. John, is there anything else you want to add? Uh, you're muted there, I think. Yeah, no. The, um, there, well, there's a lot in what you've said, um, and it's covered a lot of ground. Um, one of the things that I, that I find, and I know you have found it to some degree, is that there's a fair bit as well of this generosity that has been present in a lot of communities, or the opportunity to demonstrate generosity that wasn't there before because there were people who were perfectly able to go out and get their own groceries and now people had to get them for them or also there's also a fair bit of simmering anger um i'm certainly getting far more mr angry type emails about this that the other about fairly trivial things that probably would be let pass in other circumstances and I think that's partly because, and it's again, it's maybe a, a bigger issue. Um, we all realised that we had, law, we didn't have personal autonomy anymore. Or we had very limited personal autonomy. Before we did things simply because we could do them, whether we really needed to or wanted to or not. Now we couldn't. Um, and um, we realised that we weren't in control of our lives anymore. That, a number, that others or regulations were controlling our lives. And we knew that there was very little, lots of people knew there was very little like they could do about that. And it made them a mixture, there was a mixture of anger and fearfulness in the middle of that. But what we then, or what people then did was, and I think we're still a bit guilty of it, is that we projected that onto our leaders of various kinds. So we expected governments since we weren't able to make decisions, we were powerless to make some, to make infallible decisions on our behalf. And we became hypercritical of them, of particularly of government. Um, and that's not to say that uh, mistakes weren't made or that anybody is above criticism. But um, it's very easy to kind of yo-yo between kind of corrosive cynicism of what goes on at government level uh, and, uh, and sort of complacence or complacency, which is, a, I think, what we had. The people who I find and I talk to who have, and what, apart from those who had people who died or uh, who were estranged from people for long periods of time, I mean, I know couples who, um, were intending to get married, for instance, and they ended up on the day the lockdown came in different countries and couldn't see each other for months and months and months. And it was very, very, very difficult for them. But I mean, apart from those groups of people, the people who I feel if, who felt it most were by and large people who didn't have any faith, who felt that 
they should be able to manage the world or that somebody should be able to manage the world in a way that didn't deleteriously affect them. Whereas people of faith, I think, have always kind of recognized that it doesn't ultimately depend on us, that we have our little vocation, whatever that might be, wherever it is. And usually it's just what the Word of Common Prayer calls the patient continuance and well-doing. Um, not big things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we kind of, I think people of faith have a, a slightly greater ability to hunker down for a while uh, and to begin to, uh, and there are, there are certain gifts which God, I think, wants to give all of his people, but which he can only give us in certain circumstances. And the circumstances he gives us, are those are the ones where we have to admit that these things are out of our control. Now, sometimes those gifts come at very painful times, that is when we're extraordinarily sick and know that we have no other resources. I think in this thing, perhaps came, it's quite difficult times and times of inconvenience, but not as painful as in terms of illness, that we were able to receive from God certain things that we wouldn't have otherwise be able to receive because we were, were too self-reliant. We felt that we could do it and that God could fill in the little gaps of the things that we couldn't do. And we were inclined in terms of prayer, I think very often, and even those of us who are, you know, professional at the kind of thing, we were inclined to give them the fag end of our time, the little bits of time when we weren't doing something else. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we now find, we find ourselves, you know, if you weren't, well, let me say you weren't, most of us were able probably to get into a, an easier rhythm or a better rhythm and routine. Now, that's not to say the people that I really felt most for, and I think probably we did help, were, you know, some, some poor critter in the fourth floor of a block of flats in Rathcoon with three kids, running around them for months and months and months. I mean, that must have been an awful experience uh, of lockdown. And, and I don't even mean in abusive situations, but just the claustrophobia. Uh, and I, I hope and I think that the churches did their bit to kind of reach out to those. I too think we had a good war, for want of a better word. Uh, and I hope we can, as we open up, have a good peace. I'm always a little bit wary that <clears throat> I hope God's as pleased with us as we are with ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah some of these things and we need to, to always to keep those kind of critical critical faculties there. One of the other big things uh, which I thought it demonstrated something about the churches, but about the churches in Ireland particularly, was that Irish blessing yeah. you know, that was put together by, um, by Father McGill, Martin McGill, and a guy called Philip McKinley, who's an ordinand in the Church of Ireland. Uh, and they organised it and various people resourced it. And the, the things that it the two things that it demonstrated for me, is first of all, the huge diversity of expressions of faith in Ireland. Uh, and the second thing was, probably nowhere else in the world would have the same musical diversity as we had, mm -hmm. in terms of the things that were played and the way they were played in that, you know, for such a small place, the, the layers of musical kind of difference that came into that. Uh, and, you know, it's still got how many millions of hits uh, it has now. And it projected into the world the unity of the Irish church underlying all the institutional theological nuances and differences that there was this idea of discipleship and of, because of the song that was chosen because of the hymn that was chosen of in a way the rule of God the sovereignty of God uh, um, uh, that despite everything that's going on around us and despite how we feel slightly powerless that God has never for one second let it slip out of his hand yeah despite all the difficulties that we see yeah it's very taken there John by your by your mention about that um increased kind of aggression or, or, or 
uh, it's something that that does worry me a little bit and I'm, I'm saying it uh, you know maybe as a challenge to all of us here uh, how do we speak into that and and I do feel one of the roots of it was where people felt that individual freedom or individual choice uh, was suddenly no longer, uh, you know, paramount. Um, I, I mentioned it earlier uh, when I was speaking there that I feel this was one of the great positives of uh, to come out of what happened was the fact that people were indeed prepared to to make s personal sacrifices for the greater good and for the protection of life uh, and and health. Um, but I do feel that uh, there is a constituency out there who feel that all this was was an attack on freedom. Uh, indeed, in some cases, I'm getting quite a bit of correspondence from people saying that we in the churches have given in to this uh, uh, worldwide almost conspiracy to curtail human freedom and personal freedom and choice. Uh, uh, I really feel this is something that we need to be able to answer. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that uh, the whole uh, virus has raised serious questions about the, the almost accepted uh, orthodoxy that everyone is entitled to their own personal freedom and choice at all times. And whenever people have that curtailed, in other words, they're not able to travel for their, for their holiday. They're not able to visit their grandparents. They're not able to go into the hospital to someone who is sick or to be, uh, to be able to have a party or what it might be. There is, I think, deep down within us an, a kind of a visceral reaction against that. And that is perhaps, as you said, projected onto those who are given the blame for curtailing those freedoms. I feel that we in the church, and I think we possibly need to even work out a theology uh, where we can express to people that to deny yourself for others is a positive thing. And, and uh, I'm trying to think, what are, the, what are the learnings from this that we in our preaching and our teaching and in our, in our spiritual reflections with people can say? Uh, the, I really do feel that, uh, as Bishop, Archbishop John said, whenever we met with the executive office, for example, or the members of the team there, or indeed uh, whenever uh, I had the opportunity to speak with the Taoiseach and some of his team, I find myself um, uh, gently encouraging them. And the, well, I think we felt that Archbishop John, when we met with the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister and some of the junior ministers, we as churches were there to um, also nourish them because it is not an easy place to be, to be making those decisions. You're going to be wrong no matter what you decide to do. Um, and I really feel that people like ourselves are going to be uh, called upon to, to, to give, bring a calmness and to a depth to the conversation and to the discussion. If anything, I'm a little bit disappointed that we haven't, and indeed society hasn't, uh, found spaces to have this kind of conversation. Uh, the, the, the prevailing narrative each night is number of deaths, number of cases, graphs, mathematical, statistical analysis, but this is human life. I think during the height of the lockdown, there was far more uh, deep down reflection on what's happening than there is now. And perhaps that's a challenge for all of us in our congregations between now and Christmas to get people to go a little bit deeper and, and study some of these questions that I'm talking about. I really do feel because the whole coronavirus crisis has moved us to question our normal lifestyle, to question our unsustainable, let's say, demand for production, for consumption, might it be calling us to conversion? You know, uh, might this crisis be moving us to, to a change of heart? Uh, uh, to, might it be uh, forcing us in many ways to reflect on our relationship with nature, with God, with each other, uh, with the poor? with the marginalized, those who are less fortunate. And we haven't mentioned that yet in our conversation tonight. 
the way that, particularly during that absolutely amazingly beautiful springtime, how so many of us noticed sunsets. We, we heard bird song. <laughs> the, the, the satellite photographs showed uh, a clarity in the atmosphere, fish in the sea. Suddenly we became more in touch with, uh, with the earth, our common home. And equally, um, I hope and I would love to have seen more of this as solidarity with the most marginalized people in our world. How little reflection there is in our nightly news bulletins about the impact of the virus on developing world, on countries where they don't have access to healthcare, to, to clean water, where they don't have access to uh, masks and PPE and all of the things that we've now taken for granted. And I wonder if there's another call to us there to, to, to hear the cry of the poor in the world and how they are feeling about the virus. I, I was away in January in Latin America. I visited uh, Peru, uh, Nicaragua, and um, I, I really did feel, I also was in Ecuador, I've been in touch with some of those people over the last six months and they've been going through hell, pardon my expression. They've been going through a terrible time and it's not breaking the surface of our, um, I suppose, first world um, uh, obsession with the number of cases today. Where's the graph at? How many, where are they? You know, we, we are still comfortable, if you don't mind me saying that. And I think maybe as churches, uh, we have to draw attention to those in the world who are much less fortunate than we are and who are feeling this really sore. Yeah, and I think that's true even closer, you know, to home. Um, the big structural problems in Irish society, north, north and south, and they're, they're different in the different jurisdictions, but is you know very telling that uh, you know uh, for my money probably the great profit uh, of our in Irish society from coming from a religious background over the past twenty years has been Peter Peter McVeary, who has said that uh, the housing problem and he doesn't just mean rough sleepers as you would say they're just you know a sign of something much much deeper uh, that housing problem isn't caused just by a lack of houses it's caused by a dysfunction within the whole economic model under which we work, and because housing uh, eats up such a huge amount of capital for people that, that, that money isn't available for other things, and no sort of structure yet. Pretty well in Great Britain and Ireland, they were able to house all the homeless on the street very quickly. So they were, they were able to deal with a certain symptom of the problem, but haven't looked at what caused the problem, that divide between rich and poor, which is very, very clear. No, I mean, there are all sorts of injustices to do with identity and ethnicity and all the rest of it. But still, the largest injustice in any society, North and South, like any other society, is, a, is economic injustice. The inability of people to be able to live in a way that, is, um, uh, that protects human dignity. Um, and I suppose the nearest parallel we have with what's been happening over the past four months is the 2008 financial crisis. Mm. And of course, everybody blamed the banks. And the bank, there was certainly a huge amount wrong with the banks and with certain individuals and, and the decisions that they made. But I do remember being asked at the time, who's to blame? For it was out of back, background in economics from it before. And I said, well, you and me. Weird blame. Because we thought we could have everything. We thought we could have limitless supplies of money, particularly. Now, where the banks, I think, in that situation went wrong was, and where the regulators went wrong, was that they treated money as though it was just another commodity like anything else. When it isn't, money is like the kind of blood that flows through the body. And it's not the same as everything else. It has to be treated and protected in a certain way and rationed almost in a certain way. Um, and I've just written an article for our search, which is a search of Ireland quarterly, and said, what should we do in the face of this? And I said, we should just, what Archbishop Eamon has been saying, we should repent. We should 
turn round. We should examine what the way we have been living uh, and work out what the connection is between the way we have been living and what has happened to us. Mm -hmm. That's a factor of globalization, uh, whether it's a factor of wanting to have strawberries in February, if you know what I mean. Um, so all of those things have, have played into this. And the people who are going, or will suffer most, unless there are some structural changes made, are young people. It's not just that they've lost six months of education. They've had their career prospects shredded because of, you know, a very, very few small companies will come out of this well. Many of them just go to the wall. Very few big companies will come out of it well unless they're in tech and some of those other things. Mm -hmm. The fact that they missed six months of education but has probably set them back years in terms of personal development, in terms of sociability and all that. And unless, so, and I think what they will want to see when the recovery comes is one where my generation are prepared to make sacrifices for that generation, whether that's in through structural tax reform, whatever it might be, that we are prepared to have less resources so that they can have what they need to make a future for themselves, both in education and in the shape of the economy. And the other thing, which as you know, that generation will definitely look for, and I think it's a key to political success in the future, is that the recovery, whatever it is, is a green recovery. Mm. And it's a recovery that respects uh, the relationship between ourselves and the creation. Therefore, when I was growing up, even which is you know which is long enough ago, but it's not that long ago. People, people's economic worth was tied to what they could produce, what they could make. And nowadays, people's economic worth is and a country's economic worth is tied to what they can consume. Mm. And that was an essential shift in an economic balance and paradigm which has led us to, to some degree to where we are today. And there, and there are, you know, there are all sorts of think tanks and whatnot out there who have very good things to say. The problem is it can be very dull and it's all about, you know, it's, you know, the, the grim science of economics and whatnot. But economics, as you know, was once taught in university departments as a subset of ethics. Mm. It was the right relationship between people and resources and people and money. And we need to recapture that again, that ethical basis of how we organize ourselves uh, economically. And I could then start to go on about all sorts of things to do with Brexit and whatnot, but I won't because that is definitely a tangent. Okay. John, I think that um, maybe we might hand back over to Pauline in a moment, but before we do, uh, just to maybe sum up for you all what uh, Archbishop John and I have been, we were beginning essentially by just taking a few little practical things that we noticed uh, that were little glimmers of hope in the midst of the the the, the awful harrowing nature of what was happening. Um, we were, uh, I think we've been trying to get across to you that we ourselves have grown closer through this, uh, Archbishop John and I, and the, the other church leaders, uh, the, the moderator, the president, president of the Irish Council of Churches, we've been meeting very regularly. And these are the kinds of conversations we're having. Not just simply, you know, what's the guidelines say about how many we can have inside the choir or none or can we allow to sing? But we have actually found ourselves going deeper <clears throat> and having this kind of conversation. So what we were trying to do was to model that a little bit for you tonight, because to me, that's the greatest sign of hope and learning from this crisis. If it draws people closer to God, closer to each other, and begins to force people to ask some of those bigger questions and, and, and uh, you know, reflect on some of the deeper issues, the ethical issues, the, the issues about living, the issues of the whole um, linkage that we have in the world, that interconnectedness that we now have in this common home of ours. Uh, and also, of course, the interconnectedness of our physical health, our mental and emotional health, and we would contend as, as, as church leaders, our spiritual health, that if we are to come through this uh, time together, 
and come out of it with a greater sense of the importance of spiritual uh, well-being, then that's a tremendous uh, sign of hope for all of our churches. So maybe we'll hand back, will we, John, to yeah, share yes, yes. to see what you would maybe like to ask some questions of us.